the public opinion polling suggests the public, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, are all in favor by large majorities of having a paid leave policy. Hi, I'm Aparna Mathur, and I'm a resident scholar in economic policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And I'm really glad to have my co-director from Brookings, Isabel Sawhill. Isabel is a senior f fellow at the Brookings Institution. And we've both been working on what we call the AEI Brookings Paid Family Leave Project, which has involved pre people from multiple organizations, people with different backgrounds, different perspectives. Some of them have worked in Republican administration, some more on the Democrat side. Uh, this has been a year-long project. We've invited a diverse group of experts, people from academia as well. Uh, and we're really excited to be talking about the issue, which is the provision of a federal paid family leave policy in the United States. So, Belle, I'm just going to quickly turn to you and, uh, you know, Maybe you can talk a little bit about why we felt the need to bring together this group of experts and why we need this policy in the U.S. Uh, I think the main reason that the U.S. needs a paid family leave policy is because we're the only country uh, in the advanced world that doesn't have such a policy right now. So if you're um, a young parent and you have a new baby you, uh, and you also have a job, you have no way, if you're dependent upon your earnings from work, to stay home with that baby. And so we think this is particularly uh, a problem for low-wage workers uh, who can't afford to give up the income but who also need to be home with a new baby. So that, I think, uh, was the basic uh, motivation for this group's work. And like you, Aparna, I'm really excited that we got through this process with yeah. such a terrific group of people. And although we argued and debated and didn't <laughs> always agree, That's right. in the end, we got to a place where we were able to find some common ground and make some recommendations. That's exactly right. And I think the other reason, you know, when you look at sort of the changing demographics in the U.S. today, the fact that we have many more mothers actively participating in the workforce, the fact that we have, uh, you know, uh, the CEA did an interesting study, the Council of Economic Advisors did an interesting study saying nearly all of the middle income growth since the 1970s can be attributed to the increased labor force participation of women and especially you know mothers with children and so it's really interesting to me that you know we're at a situation in the US today where we're still debating whether mothers and you know fathers should be able to take a few weeks off at the time of you know having a child when we we recognize the challenges that working families face in you know dealing with work having childcare responsibilities at home i think you know this is a policy whose as we say in our report whose time has come yeah let me just reinforce something you just yeah. said because i think it's so important and not well understood and that is this fact that if we care about economic growth in the United That's States, right. if we think that we're going to be able to raise the growth rate from where it is now, which is around 2% or a That's little right. bit under, to something like 3% or higher, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we have more people working. working. We're an aging population. Uh, therefore, labor force participation is falling for that reason alone. The only bright spot in this picture in terms of economic growth is the, the uh, female labor force, as you just said, and virtually all of the uh, growth in middle class incomes in recent decades has been because more women were working. And now we're in a situation where if you look at the U.S. and you look at how much women are working in the That's U.S., true. it's yeah. going down, whereas it's still going up in other, other countries, countries that we compete with. That's absolutely true. And also talking about aging, well, I'm glad you brought that in because I think we need to clarify why we focused on just parental leave. And, you know, as you said, there are families have a lot of responsibilities, uh, which is not just caregiving for children, but caregiving for, you know, elderly 
parents or or even you know the need to take time off for your own illness and and I, and I think we need to make clear that we are not sort of discounting those other reasons for leave i think we you know we as a group we were very clear that the reason we we want to uh, f focus on parental leave is because we don't have enough data we don't have enough analysis of w how we would design a leave policy that covers not just parents but also n the need for leave for other reasons but we hope to get into that over the course of the next yeah, year. Yeah, I, th I think that it's really, uh, again, worth emphasizing that there are sort of three right. important reasons to take leave. One is the uh, birth or adoption of a baby or even, you know, adopting a child right. from foster care. Uh, but a second would be if you were sick yourself for a long time period, like if you had cancer. And a third would be uh, if you had a family member who needed your care. And it's going to be a lot cheaper in the long run if we are able to take care of our own family members instead of putting them, let's say, in a nursing home that's going to cost a lot of money uh, through Medicaid that's uh, going to be covered by the, from, from taxpayer funds. That's exactly right. And I think, so having sort of, you know, spoken about the different, the need for different types of leave, I think it's also important to highlight where the U.S. is on this policy today, you know, in terms of the federal policy, as we said, there is no federal policy today. What we have is uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act that was passed in 1993 that allows people 12 weeks of job protected but unpaid leave for the reasons that you that you just mentioned. Uh, but we don't have a federal paid leave policy. And, and what we're seeing is really a lot of state experimentation. So California was the state that had a, a leave policy passed in 2004 that offered some types of paid leave. But well, even in those states, we're not seeing sort of really high take up rates and we're seeing issues with people accessing that leave. And, you know, I think right, that's worth right. mentioning. So as there well. are five states now, right? right. There's that's California. Right. Uh, and New Jersey, New Jersey and Rhode Island, and then two new ones, That's right. uh, very recent, the District of Columbia and New York, mm -hmm. uh, who have all passed paid leave policies at the state level. And uh, two of the most generous, I guess, have not gone into effect yet. yet. This is going to give us an opportunity to see how well all of that works. Right. And, you know, when you look at California, uh, I think, so we'll get into our plan later, but I think the reason why you know, people are not that comfortable taking the, the six weeks of leave that comes with the California paid leave program is that they say that it doesn't come with job protection or, uh, you know, the wage replacement rates are really low. So, so California offers a 55 percent wage replacement and and people are, you know, especially low wage workers are just not comfortable saying, oh, I'm going to go on for six weeks and accept a 50 percent you know, or so wage replacement. So I think we're seeing a lot of issues in the state programs. And you're right, you know, New York is going to be fairly generous and, and we have some worries about the cost estimates, mm -hmm. right? Like we, we are a little bit unclear on what that yeah, means for, yeah, let, for the Let funding. me say a, a word yeah. more about costs. Uh, we did worry a lot about whether employers are going to be able to handle this. That's and we right. wanted to make sure that the costs were not imposed directly on businesses. Right. So this is not an employer mandate, yeah. and we're not expecting businesses to pay the costs. Yeah. Instead, uh, we're talking about trying to have a new payroll tax or a slight increase in existing payroll taxes uh, to help families uh, have this leave when, when a baby comes. Uh, but there was a lot of concern in our group about not burdening Businesses, businesses with new costs and right. possibly uh, reducing hiring. And you should say something about the gender equality oh, issue. Oh, that's a great thing. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so so what we were absolutely emphatic on in the working group, there were absolutely no disagreements on the issue that we need to make this policy available to both mothers and fathers. I think, you know, we, we sometimes see even in the way the private sector is doing it, they, you know, the, the policies that are offered uh, for parental leave are longer weeks for mothers and you know, slightly shorter weeks for dads. And I think it's about time we recognize that dads play an extremely important role in the household in those initial weeks of bonding with the child, of, of being there to provide childcare. 
so, so I think it's important to make the policy gender neutral and, and it's also important for economic reasons, which is we don't want businesses to discriminate against women. We don't want businesses to say, oh, we know this woman is going to be taking, you know, the six or eight weeks that, that's coming through the parental paid leave policy. Uh, so, so, you know, why should we hire her? And I think that's worth pointing out. You know, those are all the discussions we had about why we don't want an employer mandate and why we want the policy to be gender neutral. So let's talk a little bit about our compromise plan that we offer. Uh, right. Uh, again, we were both really excited, I think, yeah. that we were able <laughs> yeah. to get to uh, a final compromise plan. Now, I should say, uh, as you know, that not everybody yeah, loved absolutely. this plan. <laughs> uh, people from both the right and the left were a little um, unhappy about some aspects of it. But they all signed on, and they all were reasonably enthusiastic in the end. That's right. And what the plan said was that we should provide eight weeks of paid leave uh, to new parents, either moms or dads, uh, that secondly, uh, we should replace the wage, the normal wage that you would earn right. uh, at a rate of 70%, mm -hmm. uh, that we should cap it at $600 a week. That means that if you are a much higher income worker, uh, the proportion of your earnings that's going to be replaced is going to be much smaller because of the cap. That's right. So it's progressive, but that reflected the fact that we wanted to make it somewhat progressive, somewhat targeted to uh, lower income workers. Interestingly enough, the conservatives in our group, they wanted a new means-tested program for this purpose. Yeah. And the more liberal uh, colleagues that we had, uh, they were in favor of a longer leave and uh, funded in a little different way. But in the end, we said it should be financed by some combination of a payroll tax on employees, on workers, right. not employers, yeah. and also some uh, reduction in current programs in the federal budget. That's right. Uh, as long as those programs weren't already helping low-income families. We didn't see any point in reducing some programs for low-income families in That's order right. to create this new paid leave policy. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it was a really fun discussion, you know, a lot of disagreements on how we designed this. And I think that speaks to sort of the political climate we're seeing in the U.S. today on these and the diversity of opinions on this issue. You know, you have Republicans who are in favor of a much, uh, you know, much more targeted, relatively inexpensive plan. And then we have uh, you know, the Family Act and other sort of uh, more democratic ideas which offer much more generous weeks of leave. And I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons why this compromise sort of made sense, I think, to both sides was, as you said, on the funding. Yes, we need a payroll tax hike because we're talking about a new program, but at the same time, we don't want to increase debts and deficits. We recognize that the, you know, the U.S. faces a fiscal imbalance and we, and we need to be conscientious and we need to be careful about any new spending program. So we, so we do talk about you know, cutting spending and, and making the entire plan budget neutral. Right. So I think that's what yeah, I if, if I were a conservative, what yeah. I would be arguing right now is this makes a lot of sense. Right. But if we're going to add a new, what might be viewed as a new entitlement program for parents, yeah. we need to cut back on enti an entitlement somewhere else in the system. system. Yeah. Now, it's interesting uh, when President Trump was campaigning, hmm. uh, he was in favor of doing doing this through the unemployment insurance, insurance system, system. Uh, and the proposal that he put forward would require either raising unemployment insurance taxes or reducing benefits. Hmm. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and you may want to say more about this, yeah. we went over, we were invited over to the West Wing of the White House to brief uh, Ivanka Trump, who of course is the big champion That's of right, paid yeah. leave. And uh, she looked at our report and she seemed to really like it. Uh, she also said that they were open to uh, other ways of doing this. Yeah, I think that was a really exciting development for us because I think, uh, you know, there's been so much discussion about the Trump campaign idea about how to fund paid leave through state unemployment insurance. I know we had a big discussion about it in our working group. There are lots of concerns about trying to do it at the state level. You know, does that mean higher payroll taxes on employers? Uh, you know, how? what about eligibility? What about benefits? A a and so there's a big concern about trying to shift the burden onto the states. And so it was really nice. 
uh, to have that meeting at the White House, to have them read our report carefully and say, yeah, you know, this is fantastic. You know, in so many ways, it, it's sort of trying to get that common ground from the Republican or the Democratic side or the conservative and the liberal side. And yes, this is, you know, a policy that probably will help to get that conversation started. So, so that was really exciting mm -hmm. uh, for our group. And I think it speaks well about the report that we managed to, as you said, despite all the disagreements, get people to, to come together on, the, on this platform. So, so where do we think this is heading? Yeah, uh, you know? yeah that, that's the big yeah. question. And everybody asks us this question, yeah, you know, right. where is it heading? And are we going to have legislation this year? <laughs> and uh, as much as I would like us to make progress on this, I can't say I'm terribly optimistic right now yeah. about legislation this year, given everything else that's uh, on the agenda and all the difficulties. Uh, the right. Congress is having with their priorities on tax cuts and health care and so forth. Uh, but I think the good news here is uh, the issue is very much in the um, public domain now. It's on the radar. Uh, the public opinion polling in favor of it suggests the public, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, are all in favor by large majorities of having a paid leave policy. So that's the good news here, and we can find uh, the right window, I hope, to get this uh, actually enacted. That's exactly right, and I think that also gives us time to, to sort of get into the details, as we said, of other types of leave, because you, know, you, you probably would have more people sign on to such a policy if you said, you know, this is not just about parental leave, this is about the need for leave for, for you when you need to take time off for your own illness, for, for you when you need to take time off for your parents. I think you know, right now, sometimes the, the pushback that we get is, why should I be paying for someone else to have a child, right? And, and um, I think over the course of the next year, we, we definitely want to expand this proposal to include other types of leave, to get at least get on the same page about what that might mean for a federal policy. So we're really optimistic. We, we hope to do much more on this over the course of the next year. Um, and, and you know, let's see how this plays out uh, on the political level. But thank you so much, Bill, for, for coming here. We hope to continue this conversation with you, and it's been great having you as a co-director, especially. Oh, Aparna, it's been my pleasure, and it's been really great to work with you. And I think this partnership between Brookings and AEI uh, is a real role model for people going forward. Thank you. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Isabel Sawhill. Thank you so much for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you would like AI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to see a full report on paid family leave, check the links in the description below. Thank you.